All right, welcome to um, optional skill up call OLS five, week nine. Um, does it mean we're past halfway through? Oh wow, <laughs> time flies. Um, welcome to those of you who've just joined us, and hello um, for those of you who have been with us for the past two months. Um, uh, just a reminder for you all that we have a code of conduct and community participation guideline um, that applies to all our interactions in this call. Um, you can find the uh, full text of that in, with the link in line 84 of the notes. Um, but basically, be kind to one another, respect each other, keep an open mind. If you experience or witness unacceptable behaviors or have any other concerns, please feel free to report that to um, one of the organizers here, uh, Malvika, myself, you are here, and also there's Berenice. You can contact all of us at team at openlifesci.org or um, individually with either one of our email addresses. Um, all of those are on line 86. There is also a other.ai facilitated automatic live transcription um, in this call. So if you want to click on, if you want to see the transcription, you can click on the um, button that says life on otter.ai on the top left of your screen. Um, and there will be a link to the transcription or there is a link to this page directly on line 87 of the call notes. So with that, really, really excited today. We have four fantastic speakers who will be sharing um, their life lessons <laughs> and experiences um, with us. Um, and um, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll have, uh, uh, Batul, I think, Belief uh, co-facilitating with us today, which I'm really excited about. And also, of course, uh, our, my fellow co-hosts, um, Malvika and Yo. Um, and we'll all take turns to introduce the speakers and they will probably introduce themselves much better as well. With that, I hand over to Batul. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, the very first talk is um, from Angela. And it's a talk I'm very, very excited for. Uh, Angela is from the Code for Science Society, and she's going to speak about her journey in open leadership. Over to you, Angela. Thanks so much. I actually have a few slides just to help share some resources. I don't know if it's possible to enable that. All right, I think that is working. So let me get it going and give me one second. Take your time, don't worry. Thank you. All right, I've lost my Zoom interface. Okay, give me another second. <laughs> um, okay, I will try to share first and then see how presentation mode goes. Are you seeing? Yeah, we see the slides, uh, your pictures. You see from my side or from the? Which view yeah. are you seeing? Well, I see a beautiful picture uh, in a slide. Is that the one okay. that you want to share? Yes, just one slide, one big gray <laughs> slide. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I believe I have about eight minutes or so, so I will try to keep it brief, but I am really excited for um, for the discussion and, and to learn from the other panelists as well. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I, on this screen, instead of the typical, like my name, huge plastered at the front, I wanted to foreground some of the people who have been really integral to my own career, just to acknowledge and recognize how others have helped shape me, um, and the direction that I'm going in. I think, you know, so often we end up talking about like individuals as if they are just achieving everything all on their own. And so much of what I've been able to do is because of the people who I've been able to collaborate and work together with. So I just wanted, I think that's the general slant of my whole <laughs> presentation today is like find great people and work together with them. Um, that, yeah, that's really what to me has been a key part of my own journey. Um, I don't usually get the chance to really reflect on my personal career. Um, you know, often I'm foregrounding the kind of research and research findings. So this was an interesting exercise for me. Um, I definitely usually never reflect on my undergraduate training, but I think it's actually really important because so much of our worldview actually stems from our kind of educational experiences. Um, 
And I thought for this conversation to be relevant to mention that my early training was in an interdisciplinary science program. Um, it was called Science, Technology and International Affairs with a particular focus on international development. Um, and so as part of my studies, I took conservation biology, botany, macrobiology, and I ended up writing my honors thesis on the wetlands of Lake Victoria in East Africa, which is where I did um, independent research. Sorry for the graininess of these images. I haven't seen them blown up and these are quite old, um, kind of pre, pre cell phone pictures. So, um, but here you'll see some of the wetlands of Lake Victoria. Uh, and so as I was doing my first attempt at independent research um, and, and conducting this original research project, um, I realized that what I really enjoyed was getting the opportunity to talk to people and learning from them and learning from their perspectives, as opposed to trying to be prescriptive about what they should do. I found it really um, more interesting to learn from these different stakeholder groups and hear about the kind of similarities and, and breaks in their narratives. And so this was the beginning of, I think, my shift to becoming a social scientist. Um, and then one of the things that I observed during this first research project um, were questions of technology. Um, so I was studying the wetlands and studying adaptations to climate change. And one of the adaptations was that farmers were increasingly relying on their mobile phones to get information. And so questions about trust, technology usage, um, and how and why people were using mobile phones became interesting to me. And so I received a Fulbright to further these research questions. And I moved to Nairobi in 2010. And, um, and right around that time, you know, there's a very interesting period in Kenyan tech and the iHub, which is pictured here, um, was one of the first co-working spaces um, in the country to really get set up. It started in March, 2010, right around when I was moving. And so um, I kind of got, I was lucky enough to really get um, pulled into the community there and start, um, interacting and, and getting to know people. And so um, by the time my Fulbright was coming to a close, I was offered a job to become a research manager at the iHub and uh, ended up working there for five years, um, helping to kind of produce research that was looking at questions of um, technology. And at the time it was especially mobile phone related, but um, across different tech and development um, projects. So. I continue to have strong ties to Kenya um, and a desire to continue contributing um, to and about um, research in Kenya um, in the long term. Um, one of the projects in 2014 that came to us that I have researched um, ended up becoming really important to my own career as well. This was an opportunity to help manage a new research network called very long, wait for it, <laughs> Open and Collaborative Science and Development Network. We called it OCSDNet for short. Um, and this was a network funded by IDRC and ZIPID. And the network included scientists, development practitioners, and community activists from 26 countries in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And so for two years under this project, um, which I, I worked on together with um, Leslie Chan, who may be familiar to some of you who works in open access, especially, um, and others. Uh, we uh, facilitated network members to study in their own context how an open approach to science might contribute. And there was a might with actually a big discussion about how we can include might, but the question was really like to allow for the opening that maybe it's not always open, it's always good, but like how might an open approach possibly contribute to sustainable development? Um, so this this really became the basis for my, my own growing understanding about the kind of nuances to questions of openness. Um, and I didn't put it on this slide, but there, oh, here's a manifesto that came out of it. Um, and there's also a book project that uh, edited volume that came out of it, the work as well. So um, I left the IHUB in 2015 to return to the Academy in order to do a PhD in social cultural anthropology. Um, and I often tell people that I had never taken an anthropology class until my first class in my first year of my PhD. So it was a bit of a gamble to, to decide to go back to school, to move from Kenya to California, which is the program that I was accepted to, 
to do a PhD in social culture anthropology, but I was really motivated to join an anthropology department because I found the literature best helped me to understand questions of power, of difference, human difference and equity. Um, and especially in communities, um, not of the kind of uh, base of the pyramid, if you will, but especially communities of scientists, communities of researchers. Um, my, my doctoral project was motivated by this desire to understand why researchers um, continue to research and eventually lead to feelings of research fatigue in communities that are researched. Um, why, what are the, the kind of uh, infrastructures, if you will, that lead to particular people and places feeling so heavily researched, but not feeling any benefit. So that was kind of part of the motivation for my, for my research project. Um, and as part of studies, so six years of study, um, I just completed my, my doctoral in December. And as part of my studies, you know, I really began to find spaces where there are similar minded um, scholars and activists working on some of these kinds of questions. And so I'm putting this here and I'm sharing it because perhaps it might be useful for some of you. Um, the field of the social studies of science um, has become a key resource for me. Um, you know, many of the concepts uh, resonate, but also especially for the friends and like-minded colleagues. Um, and so I've ended up getting quite heavily involved in the society. Um, and this is something I'll reflect on shortly. Um, but there's an upcoming conference in December um, for those who might be um, interested to check it out. Um, and then I also put a QR code here in case anyone is interested for my kind of research side of things. Um, this is my open access um, dissertation published on e-scholarship. Um, really after building on my experience both at the iHub and then six years of study and a year of ethnographic research, looking at the production of research in Kenya. So really trying to understand um, how researchers have shifted their in their own thinking about what makes research good and ethical. Um, and, and so I would be very happy for any feedback on that. Um, and as part of the doctoral work, I set up an ethnographic data sharing platform on open source software, which I'm happy to talk more about. Um, it's called the Platform for Experimental Collaborative Ethnography, but it's PEACE for short. I think I end up being part of these um, <laughs> long acronyms. Um, and so I set up a, a data ethnographic data sharing platform to share my own research data back with my interlocutors, um, as well as to open up new spaces for collaboration and hopefully better research relations. So on this bright orange slide, um, these are, are some of the different roles I currently hold. Um, as, as was mentioned in my intro, I now serve as the senior program manager at Code for Science and Society. Um, I'm also uh, an associate editor on an editorial collective um, for the open access journal, Engaging Science, Technology and Society. Um, and then I'm also a founding member for the open data repository I just mentioned, um, which we call research data share. And then I am also an elected council member on the Society for the Social Studies of Sciences governing body. So, um, you know, someone once said to me, they wondered how I've been able to keep one foot in the academy and one foot in the kind of practitioner worlds. And so I think there is definitely a dash of just serendipity in there, but um, at, at a high level, I think there are some things that have enabled me to continue to hold and find interesting and, and diverse collaborations. And so I've put some of what has worked for me on this slide. Um, and I wanted to signpost the for me part just because it might not be possible for you, or it might not be something that resonates with you. Um, I think more than perhaps even the first three points is the idea that like what's most important is to periodically reflect on your own strategies and what has worked for you so that you can be more intentional in leaning into them. Um, I think the more that you know about yourself and the environment that you find yourself um, flourishing in and you find yourself really thriving in, the better you can then use that information to identify the right kinds of opportunity for you and the right kinds of collaborators for you. So I think that 
more than what's worked for me is probably figuring out what works for you um, and then trying to, to really be mindful as you look for new opportunities that you know what works for you. Um, but the first three points here are for me, it has really been helpful to spend time. And I think often that's something we don't have enough of, but to really be mindful of my time and where I'm spending it to build good relations um, with and in communities that you care about. So as I mentioned, you know, my research work and current work continues to build on the foundation of my time in Nairobi. Um, and I don't think I could have asked the kinds of research questions I did without that experience. Um, and I continue to work with several of my former colleagues have actually co-authored some of my dissertation chapters. Um, and so we continue to work together in various ways. Um, and I think referring to my time with council, so building up of a scholarly society um, felt very important, especially in the place three years ago when I joined council to see how it has really become more um, grown and its infrastructure is really exciting. And I'm happy to continue working from the kind of inside. Um, I think working on the inside is helpful to also build the relationships and a sense of who's who so that you can better identify the second point, which is the people that you would like to work with. Um, I think it's really important for to work with people whose politics you respect. Um, for me, that has meant faculty member, members that respect their students, that treat them as colleagues, um, that genuinely seek to build their careers. Um, and for me, this has been people that, that I trust and that trust me. And, and I think that's really important to have those kind of shared, shared values, shared politics. Um, and then finally, I think trying to find, but if they don't exist, trying to build the collaborations that will sustain you. So for me, again, you know, uh, I have two young children and um, in my department, there were not many faculty with, with young children and there were many students with young children. So we ended up coming up with a PhD mama collective um, and many of these women I'm still good friends with. Um, and that kind of um, helped sustain me throughout the program. And then similarly, the working group that came around the ethnographic data sharing platform. So um, I think not to take up more time, I'll just leave my contacts here um, as well as my Twitter handle. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to talking more. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Angela, for really sharing such an inspiring journey. I'm speechless. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Actually, OCSD Net is one of the projects that I think Malvika has introduced me to and it's been instrumental in the way I reflect and practice open science itself. So thank you so much. We have, um, so guys, if you've got any question, feel free to unmute yourself or you can write it in the chat and I can read it out loud. We have a couple of questions in the Etherpad now. One of them is asking if you can elaborate more in your uh, ethnographic research. I think Maya is asking this question. Sure, I could talk for a very long time, <laughs> but um, I wonder if there's uh, more specific aspects. I, I, as I mentioned, I began interested in this question of kind of um, over research or, you know, this idea that there are certain communities that are hyper saturated with research. And that um, leads to a particular, uh, if I was studying just that, I think I would have come up into kind of um, almost like a predetermined project, but I was really interested in understanding what the possibilities for the future are to, to, to towards equity, towards actually on this last slide, like what, what we could do differently. Um, I think critique is really important, but I think at this point, especially those in the academy, squarely in the academy need to work beyond just critique and how do we start to build new futures. So anyway, so <laughs> that was part of the kind of tweaks and shifts in my project over over the course of the six, six years. And towards the end, I really went in um, to study three different research organizations um, of different scales to understand what they were doing to, to try to move beyond a critique that they actually all knew. So all of them, when I first started my fieldwork, everyone actually was aware of this critique of being over-research or over-research. 
um, or lack of benefit from research. And so they were all three trying to come up with new ways to, to go beyond that. And so the dissertation write up ended up being a lot of understanding actually what their structural constraints are that prevent many of these organizations from being able to fully get to a new kind of paradigm and, and the kind of funding models, the way that what I call contract time, which is basically the way that a lot of these organizations get funded is that you have to have, you know, a project that you are, are assigning every hour of every staff member time to. And so contract time prevents us from being able to really work on real questions that matter to communities often because we are instead working on questions that are tied to funders and project interests. So things like that, you know, I think a lot of, um, so, so <laughs> I can talk more on it, but I think there are a lot of aspects that I tried to use the research question to cut across that. And I think there are hopefully a lot of directions that people can take some of that research forward. I will ask just one more question. Um, and um, actually it's one also written in the other bad. You spoke a lot about building collaboration that sustain you, but uh, can you define how, how you can define this relationship? Is it good actually? That's one of the questions that came up in the other bad, but also a question I, I have in my mind. And how do you find the time to hold so many hats? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Those are two questions. <laughs> um, well, in terms of finding the time, you know, I, again, acknowledging, going back to the first slide, um, all of the people who help me to find the time or to make the time. Um, right now, my mom is visiting from Hawaii, um, which is where I'm originally from, to help with my two young children, you know, so that um, I can do a lot of the different things I do. And so, you know, the care um, that my family and and others have supported me with is really key to be able to do all of the different things. Um, and that's a privilege, I think. Um, the first question related to finding collaborations that sustain you, I think that a key thing that I have continued to have to learn or remind myself is that, you don't always have to be in the same formation or in the same relationship for the rest of time. I think this is something I learned probably from Leslie Chan when we were working on this network um, is that, you know, there's often a discussion about sustainability and that usually implies that it has to last forever. And so, um, you know, oh, a network needs to, it's great, it's doing good stuff. Okay, we should try and find more funding, keep it going forever. But I think that sometimes, you know, these kind of time delimited, delimit, delineated relationships, partnerships, networks can be okay. Like maybe that's what's needed in that particular moment at that particular time. And then for it to close and for you to think about, okay, well, what do we want to do? You know, you can reflect on all the, the learnings and the things and how do we share that with the world? But maybe it, whatever came out of that doesn't have to continue in the same configuration forever, right? And so with Leslie, you know, we decided, okay, the network is going to end. There is a date when it ends. And it's exciting to see the ways that the members of the network have gone on to do really cool things and continue to do really interesting work. Um, but it wasn't necessarily as part of this one um, setup. And I think that's okay. So I think that sometimes it's a little freeing to realize that you don't have to, just because you start something, it doesn't have to forever be like that. And that's okay. And there's, uh, you can do interesting things together for a particular period. And then you realize that, okay, um, we, we are, this is not what is needed now. And let's like pivot or, or so on. So I think that's kind of related to the like reflection constant, building in some reflective time um, to think about, well, are these things um, building me and building the work that I want to, to see continue. Um, or maybe they're not, and maybe they should be shifted and pivoted. And that open, that also opens up time for the things that you think are important in whatever future, um, period. So hopefully that's helpful. Oh, thank you, Angela. Um, Maya is saying that's really a liberating thought, and I totally agree with that. Uh, thank you, Angela, for sharing such really inspiring talk. Uh, I'm going to move to our second speaker.
Jason. Uh, Jason Williams is also going to speak about his journey. So I'm very, very excited for that. Over to you, Jason. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, let me know if anything happens. You can't hear me or something goes wrong. Zoom has not been kind to me these last days. Uh, so hopefully it will endure. Uh, thank you for, uh, to everyone for this introduction and for the opportunity to speak here. And I, I don't have any slides. I mean, there are some I could use, but maybe try to make it a little bit more uh, just a conversation um, and try to keep it low. Uh, uh, what's the way that I, was, is there a, like low maintenance? That's the, that, that would be the way that I try to describe myself. Um, so uh, I guess the topic is about uh, different career alternatives and paths and things like that. And uh, it was a pleasure hearing from our previous speaker. And I think it's kind of goes without saying that, you know, your results may be different <laughs> than my results. Um, but if I try to uh, sum things into a single expression or a single take home message that works for me and that works in the context of some of the things I do, it's that there's technology to solve every single problem uh, that, you, that you'll face. But if you don't take care of people, whatever you're doing is going to fail. Uh, so what I've spent a lot of time working on these past few years is working on uh, computational projects where um, people have been trying to build um, computer systems that let scientists do their research. So I've done that. Uh, for a number of years with a project in the US called Cyber. So we you know, build all sorts of interfaces and computing tools. I'm on several advisory boards and several projects that are trying to do the same thing. So what I'm trying to say actually, because you may not have had that experience at all, but an experience that you might have had um, is I have been involved in projects where there's a lot of people uh, trying to do something together. And in fact, it, it seems to me with these computational projects, the people are much more scattered out. It's, it's kind of different than being in a lab maybe where you have two or three close lab mates and you sort of work on things either at parallel and you kind of know what other people are doing. But a lot of the projects I seem to work on um, are inherently remote with many people doing many things in many, many different places. So if that resembles anything that you are doing, have done or will do, then maybe my advice is sort of speaking to that. Um, what I see, the difficulties are, of course, in any type of um, scientific uh, endeavor, there's, there's some big questions and big challenges that I feel everybody, since this is an open life science, <laughs> I feel that everybody can relate to in some ways that we're all interested in specific scientific questions. Um, but what I actually find is difficult or is you know, a key differentiator is whether um, people, when they're operating on a question, really have in place the ability and um, the self-awareness even sometimes to be able to be good communicators about what they're doing or what they're trying to do, uh, and the ability to uh, talk with other people. And really, I guess you would even use the word empathize with other people, where they're coming from and, and what's happening. Uh, and so projects that do that really well, I see do better. And then projects that don't um, do as well with that, I see them you know, really struggle and, and not understand necessarily if they're struggling because the problem is just hard or they're struggling because they're just missing some key ingredient that they never seem to find. Um, I'll keep myself to another three or four minutes. I don't wanna to talk too long. I wanna hear from all of you and maybe have conversations, but um, what I find is that in a lot of cases in life and in science and things like that, um, the goals are not clearly articulated or the big picture of what everyone's really working for. Um, it's really easy to lose that. And so what happens is that many individual people try to do what seems to be the right thing to do sort of locally, you know, in, in their field of vision or whatever it is that they can control or whatever their project they're working on. But in the end, I've seen a lot of times where it, things don't come together because people don't actually understand what they're working on or what they're trying to do. So the big project that I mentioned earlier is out of, I'm not trying to uh, trash them, I love them, obviously my, my colleagues and friends, 
But it was an interesting realization for me because I spent a lot of time explaining that project to people, which made, forced me to become better at it. Um, so it's not that I'm somehow have some deeper insight. That was just my job. And so one time I was at the university where the project was centered, which happens to be University of Arizona. And the so those people are, let's say, on the fourth floor, fifth floor, wherever, and happened to speak to a scientist, very well known, who was on the first floor. And I just happened to be casually talking to him about the project, which has been there at that point for like 10 years or something. And after talking to me, he's like, you know, you're the first person who's ever told me what that project does or explained it in a way that I can understand what happens. Um, so these people, you know, worked with this guy for years and it, he never had an understanding. He's like a senior scientist, so he should be a bright person. Just couldn't understand what was going on. And so that's what I just sort of see over and over and over again. Um, and, and, and the levels at which um, people can communicate over each other or not quite understand what's happening. It's just something that I see all the time and is really, really important. Like I see people talking to each other and I just know that I have to come and have a second conversation because the conversation that needed to happen did not happen. And I could watch the confusion and I know why, so I know where person A is coming from and what they're trying to get across. And I know where person B is coming from, but those two people have never interacted at, in the right level or in the right way to actually know where they're both coming from. And so I'll often come behind and have a second conversation. It's like, well, this is what was said, but here's what was meant. And then, and then so on and so forth. And I think some people um, or any of you I don't know that it takes any kind of special skill, but if you just kind of um, become good at that um, by really listening and learning and empathizing with people, I'll, I'll save it for my, my very last comment was the comment of um, having uh, an office mate who is also, uh, I'm not you know trying to call things out in any kind of bad way. So I had an office mate for, I had many office mates, but I had an office mate who grew up in the US but didn't come from my culture within the US. And it took me time to really realize that even though theoretically we grew up in the same country, which is a gigantic country, we grew up in really different cultures. And so it took me um, time to learn that just because you think somebody is like you doesn't mean that they are like you. And it doesn't mean it in a bad way. It just means that there are a lot of things that we take for granted. Um, one expression that I've learned to try to get rid of is the expression of, you know, oh, something, it's just human nature to do this, or it's just human nature to do that. And what I actually find out is that that's a, that's a lazy and, and wrong phrase, because what it's trying to say is that I think people will do something uh, the way that I think it should be done. And it's just totally natural, when in fact, very few things are probably human nature. It's just an excuse for not realizing that sometimes we don't appreciate um, that other people have differences from us and there's nothing wrong with that. It just means that we need to work harder to understand those differences so that we can communicate effectively. So uh, that's what it's going to be about. Any, any, any career, any success I've had in, or, you know, life path. And I guess there's a link there to a story which might give some more real details about what I am and what I do. Um, the only thing that I've seen that's been really, really, you know, especially helpful is the ability to try to communicate effectively and try to understand what other people are coming from and, and how you can um, not take for granted that they are where you think they are. So I'll, I'll stop there and open it up to conversation. I, uh, I, I, should, I should say 60 seconds, I'm sorry, I'm always uh, talking too much. I work at the, the DNA Learning Center at Coltsman Harbor and I spend a lot of time uh, trying to bring computational tools into research and education. Um, I think that's enough. Okay, so I'll go from there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. That's very, very insightful. What you said about, there's really many things that we take for granted when we try to communicate our ideas, our thoughts, our knowledge, our project. That's very, very insightful. Uh, one of the questions that came up, um, someone asking, is there any tip for navigating institutional limitations in terms of funding or reporting while leaving room for emergent goals of ways of thinking? Um, and this is in the, is this in the, um, in the chat? This in is, the chat? Yes, yes, in the third part, and I'm going to copy it and paste it in the chat. 
And whoever asked that question, if they want to elaborate or explain it better. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, if you'd like to elaborate, I think I have an idea of where this is going at, but let, please elaborate, and then I do actually have an answer. <laughs> hi. If you uh, want to, Anne. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Oh, hi, Jason. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I Yeah, I, I guess something that, um, it's funny, I'm also, I guess, an ethnographer by training, so I've been learning about uh, a lot about the Turing Way community and open science more broadly through conversations with people and so often what comes up is like my 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 community has this need this project um i'm really passionate about this work but x funding or x group requires me to do blank blank and blank and i constantly feel like i'm kind of working two jobs in order to fulfill the needs of of both of those requirements um both of the community and of of the funders uh, or supporters of a project and i'm wondering how you navigate that because that often makes it uh, time more scarce and energy more scarce and therefore empathy more scarce oftentimes. And yeah, just wondering if you had any tips in that direction. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I, 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 would, I, would, I would also say that a lot of the things that I'm privileged to do here would get me fired somewhere else, <laughs> right? Uh, because uh, it, it is a balance uh, where, you know, in some cases, you may be hired to have one of these newer roles like community manager, which the, I think the reason why those community type roles are, are appearing is because people realize they're actually critical to making a lot of things uh, work. Even though they sound soft and fuzzy, they're actually exactly uh, what is needed to make large uh, team science work. Um, but yeah, there, there's definitely a balance that one has. Like I have to balance my time um so that there are whatever the key deliverables that i'm responsible for in a grant uh you know those types of things need to get done um so it, it's a matter of how much can you align or can you make the argument for aligning uh things that you'd be interested in doing with whatever your primary job responsibilities are that's where i think this community is a potential a great resource because you're everyone else will have that problem here or you know i think a lot of people will and so that explanation and that justification no longer becomes something that you alone have to come up with but since many people are iterating over it there's a potential for you to have a coherent reason why like oh look at these other organizations that are doing the type of thing that i'm trying to bring to this group um if they're doing it maybe we should be doing it too right and and you can have a justification for that and then also there's there's going to be a little bit of personal time involved which you know depends upon your privilege i do not have children as we were just talking about you know um uh resources and things like that uh so that's a different level of you know time commitment that somebody who has a bigger family uh might not be able to put in personal time to what i would call sort of side projects uh that you try to manage in the evening when you get home or a little bit on the weekend I try to minimize those things, but it's, it does take a little bit of that time commitment to make it go. Um, maybe let me try to answer one or two other questions, and then um, I guess we've got like a minute or two, and then we need to get on to the next uh, speaker, I would assume. Um, so I, I just see a couple questions uh, about empathy. Um, yeah. I'm not an expert on that, uh, and there are people who are, uh, but I would say just like any type of Thing. It is a skill that one can practice and one can learn. Um, and it's, you know, to me, the, the place where it comes in a lot is teaching. I love to teach introductory topics because I've had so many introductory topics taught to me so poorly that I would walk away from them uh, if that was my first introduction to those topics. So I really try to think about when I'm giving a presentation or teaching and then also listening. If this was my first time walking into this, how would I receive this? You know, why would anybody, you know, try to pull apart whatever my message, whether it's a lecture or whether it's just a conversation with a colleague, why would anybody make the, the reasoning leap from A to B to C uh, if I'm giving them A and I'm giving them F and there's nothing in between? So I try to look for those places um, and try to fill in those missing places. And I think the more that you at least prioritize it, at least realize that communication is more difficult than we than we appreciate uh, on the surface of it, that, that can be the start to, to doing better. Um, but maybe I better stop talking so we can hear from others, and then I, I can um, try to answer also a comment or two in the pad. 
for, for questions that remain. Uh, happy to do that. And then with whatever time's left at the end. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, we've got one question left in the other part. If you can answer it there, that would be amazing. If you've got any tips about improving communication, that would be also amazing. Uh, and I'm going to hand it to you right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, Bato, and Angela, who've all come before. Um, righty, we're going to move on to our very next speaker. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Maya Sundukova, who is a fantastic OLS community member who will now be... Um, Maya, I'll let you introduce yourself because you'll do it better than me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Your, um, I do have uh, slides. Just it feels, you know, <laughs> less at the center of attention. Um, can you please tell me if you see the slides? We can try the slide show mode and it's looking good. Yeah, it looks good. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Um, just a second. Do you see any strange boxes on the screen? No strange boxes. Take Thank it away. You so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to, to give um, a talk to um, communication is not my strongest skill, so um, um, I'm challenged to go out of my shell. Um, I'm connecting to you from north of Spain. Um, and yeah, I use affiliations like all less open life science when I go to conferences or Mercury Alumni Association. Or often I write, tell, oh, I'm an independent researcher right now. And I'll be giving some reflections from the last year or so, where I was working towards uh, uh, building some skills in uh, terms of becoming a practitioner for researchers. And I'm curious to hear what you think about of this figure. Um, and um, this is a word cloud of my CV, um, you know, who we are, what we are, is curriculum vitae is really what we are, our life. And um, um, this slide shows more than how I always felt about my career and my identity. I was born in USSR in what was before Russia. And you know, social scientists, uh, science and humanities really sucked. So physics was the only science that was really uh, high quality. And that's why I got a degree in physics. And then I was, I guess, lucky to move out and uh, go to Italy to pursue neuroscience studies. So I did a PhD in CISA, and then I moved to EMBL, European Molecular Biology Lab uh, in Italy. Um, uh, it's a very resourceful place to do an interdisciplinary postdoc. And it always felt like I'm moving on some uh, train uh, track um until i had some uh, until life happened actually and um since last year i've been calling myself recovering academics uh, because i was revisiting um yeah reflecting on my life i have plenty of time to reflect on my life but uh still my science interests remain around biophysics ion channels pain touch microscopy and electrophysiology and it's I guess it was so exciting to do science that I never had any other role, uh, never did anything apart from science. But you know, the downside was the most of the time of experiments were done in dark rooms, in isolation. And I think it's really uh, not good for well-being of, re of, res of researchers. And uh, yeah, in, in search of excellence in research and career, I really, I guess I learned a lot from vulnerability places in my life. And um, I guess I was uh, struggling uh, with mental health issues, with stress, with relocations, pandemics, um, environments that are not supportive or um, managing work-life uh, balance. Having a young child at home with, without help, it's really tough at times. Um, it, it led me to appreciate that uh, misty times come for everyone and we, we actually never know what other people are going through, right? And um, I guess what is the, the most um, thing that I, 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 I think I value now in, in thinking about researchers is, is seeing them as uh, 
holistically as not only a brain on a stick and research um, producing agent, but uh, a complex human being. And I wish that funding bodies also would see us, uh, our outputs, research outputs, not only as a publications, but all other, recognize all the activities aside uh, as, I don't know, training or volunteering uh, things, whatever is coming with mentoring. And uh, I'm very warmed up by words of late anthropologist Mary Catherine Bateson uh, that we are not what we know, but what we are willing to learn. And uh, in the last couple of years, um, it felt I'm passing the river of unknown, uh, leaving the, the land of um, uh, academic research, you know, bench scientists into something new and in recreating a new identity um, and gaining a new status. And what, what I was um, learning about is actually how to help myself and how actually it works, like how to make it, how, what are the skills that are, are needed to help others and what can be the possible job titles or descriptions, how one could call himself. So um, as we were mentioning, um, Community managers know this is a new uh, role that appear because there is a need in such people or um, facilitators at the OLS or mentors. Now I'm so uh, happy to see that there are so much more um, mentors and mentoring schemes available for researchers. It's really, it's um, fills my heart with uh, hope. And of course, coaches uh, or even HR specialists, like what human resource personnel should be there at the academic institutions for, to support researchers, not to only <laughs> do the salary slips <laughs> thing. Um, and through this reader, I uh, can see some stepping stones that are there. And um, I'm again, not talking about like a completely new career, but rather maybe of identity or skills that one can get and it looks like um, even there was nothing really in my life that was at the level of practitioner, but I could see that there were a long time ago some activities that I was doing on my side, uh, like uh, journaling or studying therapeutic writing to, um, to help myself because, you know, scientists, they all often uh, stuck in a different country where they do not know anyone and they have some issues, they want to clarity and journaling is like <laughs> the most economic and um, affordable way to, to, to find this space for clarity and reflection. And yeah, also uh, using dance and theater to arts to, to connect with, with myself and everything. And I guess the turning point came when I, um, Amy, I got to know for Amy that she was um, um, the uh, launching the innovation leaders in 2020. And I came there with the uh, with idea um, uh, of a project that during the program, during the lockdown actually in the pandemics um, transformed in many ways, uh, but the, um, the key idea was to, to dedicate time to study transitions in lives of um, scientists and communicate in a, in a fun and light way. And after that, I was so happy um, that it happened um, to help here OLS as a facilitator at the calls and then in this cohort as a mentor and learning so much in this environment I feel thankful for, for for the environment that is created and after that I'm uh, now in a certificate program in coaching because I realized that there are a lot of metacognitive skills that one just maybe doesn't really uh, acquire overnight so it's a, a long journey and as I mentioned before uh, there are different formal mentoring schemes now for researchers. And I'm so happy to, to give back uh, to the community by uh, mentoring others in, for example, changing their career uh, or um, aiding with mental health issues. 
And I wanted to mention the REMO initiative is a cost action, um, which is, I think, the first uh, project around, you know, pan-European project around well-being of researchers. I'll put later a link, I think, in the chat. And this is how I guess it feels now, the, the, the path I'm having. There is no path. Um, but there are nice flowers, and it smells nice, and I see the perspective. Um, and what I wanted maybe to, to talk to you uh, is about the challenges or opportunities for, for these helping practitioners in academia and uh, nearby. Uh, you are mentioning that there are no formal paths or requirements. I guess there is a lot of skepticism, you know, do we really need this figure in academia? There is, I think, not enough appreciation of the skill set that is involved. And what uh, is uh, making me a bit uh, upset is that in the, more, in the world of uh, coaching, mentoring and everything, there's just so much proprietary models and certifications that you just cannot <laughs> share the knowledge that you have so easily. And of course, the, the sustainability issues, because one practitioner just can, uh, like one-to-one -one training or mentoring is not something that really can make some impact in the society. So um, yeah, I just wanted to finish uh, saying that, yeah, we can try to provide as much as guidance and research on this, put up their tools and provide care, but there are some structural issues like lack of bridges between, uh, I don't know, between academia and different sectors and society. And this is probably where I would be trying to focus on in the next decades or something. Yeah, and I want to finish up with saying thank you to you. And yeah, also thinking of all people who supported me to arrive up to now here. I hope we can now maybe have a discussion or something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Folks, can we have a round of applause for that deeply personal and amazing talk we've just had? Thank you so much. Um, so Maya, I think the thing that I was struck with the most while I was watching this talk is I had it on gallery view so that I could see all the camera beside while you were talking and it was just faces going, yeah, like I've been there, I feel that. And that was just so, so precious. Thank you so much. Um, so folks, we can have uh, questions or comments coming in on the Zoom chat um, or line 147 at the moment. We have a couple of comments. Uh, I like your notion of helping practitioner. I did HR with this in mind. It didn't end well, but I also had the proprietary, can't say that word, it's a hard word, proprietary certificate um, that nobody outside HR uh, knows. I have no tips, but the role isn't research specific and wishing you every success. Um, and another comment about loving those images, um, which I will second, coming back to that, that beautiful grassy and saying, how do I get across? And then saying, actually, we need, a, we need to make a structure to help us get across this thing really like resonated with me that all too often we struggle, but actually if there was better structure, we'd be doing so much better. Um, folks, does anyone want to um, unmute for any comments or questions? There's a lot of love coming in with plus ones, appreciating the bridges across disciplines and industries um, and the imagery that you've provided. Um, so folks, definitely, um, if you have any other uh, questions or comments, bring them in. I have uh, one for you, Maya, which is, um, I guess, just looking at the journey around, you know, moving to helping practitioner. If you um, were to let's say that you know funding was a concern and you wanted to help people uh, you know practicing around research what would be the first thing that you might choose to do if you if you didn't have to worry about things like paying the bills but actually doing what you saw is right in this role mm. so if the money would not be a problem i would probably um, um would try to um find people who want to change things um, I guess it's around like creating a community around um, I, I, I would probably focus on 
not on doing myself the service, but on um, connecting people who who know how to do things like what OLS is doing and people who have an idea um, and some skill set and maybe privileges in, to change things in their immediate environment, um, in their research lab, in the um, department, and <laughs> empower them and give them, I don't know, funding and resources so they can do things locally. Um, yeah, something like that. Thank you for a question, lovely. Thank you, I love it. Uh, Ismail, do you have a question? Yeah, and they actually start from the opposite premise of yours. Um, so knowing that money is a problem, um, have you thought, sorry, I kind of just want to have a chat with you because uh, it sounds great and this is this is everything I want from a career. So I'm just going to follow your career for a few years and see what I need to do. Um, but have you thought of like consultancy or starting your own little thing and providing, I, I, I don't know if it's, contract hours or like writing white papers for organizations. Sorry, I'm just, I don't know, it sounds very exciting. It was, it was great to hear from you. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, I love the contrast of one question and another. Um, I, what is immediately available is one-to-one -one, uh, coaching and doing workshops. Um, yeah, for Kind of people with whom it clicks uh, the approach um, with, with those people who do not like uh, maybe click with standard trainers which are kind of in the in the uh, in the suite and with nice haircut and you know with a grow model of goals uh, results and everything um, yeah but i'm not so happy with this um, uh, possibility yeah because it's like draining resources from people who already maybe are not yeah yeah but maybe, uh, uh, being a company and relying on the uh, on the yeah on the institutions or organizations is a different pair of shoes yeah yeah but we need to think up that consultancy firm idea and start draining money from the accentures and kpmgs of the world right thank you well, it would be nice to talk to someone who understands how to do these things, consultancy. Honestly, if you um, uh, HR people who've been doing HR for like, so, like, I'm not there, but people who've been doing HR for 20, 30 years end up doing exactly what you're describing. I, mm -hmm. I can't think off the top of my head who might be interested to follow, um, but that's roughly the sort of world you might be interested in. Thank you. This is amazing. By the end of the call, I think we'll have taken down capitalism and I'm here for that. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, if the, there might be time for one last question or if not, we'll move on. OK, right. I'm calling that awkward silence sign that it is time to move to our final speaker. Um, so this has been incredible. Um, next up, we have uh, Melissa. Is, do I pronounce your surname Mendonca? Is that right? That is right, yes. Amazing. I will let you do the introducing of you because you um, know you better than me. Uh, take it away. Of course. Yeah, thank you so much for um, the invitation and for the event. Like The talks so far have been wonderful and so much of the things that were discussed resonated with me. Um, at the same time, I do feel like I'm a little of an outsider, um, but I'll explain that in a bit. So I'll just share my screen because I do have a few slides. They're not very informative. It's more for my own benefit because I like to follow uh, the thought with the slides. And so I'm just talking a little bit about my road from academia to industry. So um, let me just... Um, I'll close my window because there's some road work outside and it's kind of noisy, sorry. All right, so yeah, this has been my trajectory in terms of um, studies and how I thought my life would go. And so this is where I want to start with. So as a 
young woman in Brazil, I decided to study mathematics because I was in love with the whole mathematics uh, thinking and how these things were. And I loved computers. And so I ended up finding a program for my undergrad, uh, which taught applied mathematics. And so that's where I ended up. I started studying at uh, the Federal University of Santa Catarina. Um, so I did my undergrad and I did my master's. Um, and so I took a little turn because I went to Belgium to do my PhD all in mathematics. But you can see from the dates that it, it was just like one after the other. and There was not much space in between them. And then when I finished my PhD in 2010, there was an opening. And I just want to explain to you to give you a little bit of context of how these things work in Brazil, because it's very different from most of the other parts of the world, especially the global north. Uh, in Brazil, all of the universities are free and public. And so there are private universities, but they are in, they work in a different way. And so I went to work in a public university, which means that you have one exam that you have to pass to become a professor there, and then you are hired for life. And so there's no real concept of tenure. That's a given once you join the university. And so even as a young researcher, you are hired for life. You have job security, you have um, a, a very good situation, at, at least comparing to the rest of the country, a good financial situation. And there's not a lot of real incentive to do work outside of the minimum required in your field. If you want to be a good researcher, of course, you have to go and find extra funding, you have to write grants, you have to do all of those things. But if you just want to teach and um, do the basics, you can do that as well. And so it's a different kind of situation than what I see in other countries, which is why I'm explaining. I don't know if it's better or worse. But this is the situation that I found myself when I joined the university in 2010. Um, I started working for the Department of Mathematics, uh, was teaching a lot, and uh, ended up lagging a little bit behind on research just because I couldn't find the motivation, I couldn't find the right things to do. And all over my youth, uh, since I joined the university, I was involved with the open source movement and free software movements. And it always fascinated me how these things were self-organized and how these projects were working based off of volunteer work and how these would benefit so much of uh, the rest of society. And working in the mathematics department, I started doing some research on applied mathematics and writing software and writing software in Python and getting to know a little bit closer those communities of software and open source software specifically. And so I ended ended up realizing that what I was doing at the university, I felt like I didn't have the impact that I could have if I was doing something else. And so even though I was in a very comfortable situation, I ended up deciding to leave. And so what happened was that I decided to look for other opportunities. I didn't really know what I wanted. I started learning to program. I started learning you know, best practices for software development. And I thought I would end up as a software developer somewhere. Um, and this is not really what I wanted, but I didn't know that I had other options. And so this is what, what my life was like at this point. I was very uh, unsure of what the future would bring. So at some point, I because I was involved in these um, open source software communities and I kind of knew a few people, I ended up getting to go to a conference in 2019, the SciPy conference in Austin, Texas, and participating in a sprint. So the picture that you see here is amazingly my job interview because I was actually showing my code to Ralph Gomers, who's sitting next to me there. And I was explaining that I was writing software for mathematics with uh, Python and SciPy and NumPy. And he was a NumPy maintainer at this print. And I was trying to do some stuff for NumPy and SciPy. And then we ended up chatting and he said, oh, we actually are building this different company, which is supposed to support open source maintainers. 
and would you like to start working with us? And because I was already looking, I was already in a position to, to leave academia, this was decided on my mind. That's what I did. Um, so a few months later, I started working for Bonsai, which is the company that I work on today. And then this is mostly for information, but the company works by supporting and allowing open source maintainers to work on their open source projects. And the, we have a mixed funding source, some of it from consultancy and client work, and some of it from grants. And so I can explain a little bit better if anyone's interested later, but I think for informational purposes, this is basically what it is. And then we have Quantside Labs, which is the um, public benefit division of Quantside. And so this is basically focused on supporting open source maintainers work. So what am I doing at Quantside? And this is, I went quickly through the other stuff because I think this is the most of the interesting parts, which is I am working on several different open source projects. I started working as a technical writer for NumPy and developing documentation, which I felt was an amazing segue from my career and the university because I am really interested in education. I love teaching. I love creating educational content. And so documentation was a natural thing for me. Um, and from that, I actually started getting more and more involved with community work and actually dedicating myself to building community, to improving communities and to kind of connecting people from different projects. And so at some point um, a few months ago, uh, there was this grant that CZI, so the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative offered to improve DEI in open source. And so diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is clearly a problem in open source and it has been for a while historically. Um, we have had a very biased participation in open source projects, not only in the usual gender, um, ethnicity and geographical location, um, access of diversity, but also in like backgrounds and different people who come from different uh, educational um, degrees and, and areas and all of that. And so currently I am doing work, community work uh, connected to these four communities. So NumPy, Matplotlib, SciPy, and Pandas. And what we are trying to do is actually build a cross project DEI focused team. And so this is a lot of community work and one could say completely different from what my undergrad studies were, but at the same time, I feel like this has been such a natural connection for me because as I have grown, and this is echoing the words of the people who spoke before here, I think as I've grown, I, I have started to understand that the human part of every single project or community is actually the most interesting part of it. And the technical aspects are cool and interesting and we can work on that, but working on creating these human connections, working on understanding what makes these communities comfortable, safe, and uh, interesting for people to contribute to and actually understand what they want to get from their contributions to our project has been extremely interesting to me. And so these are my current projects. I'm not gonna be talking for too long. So if you wanna chat about it, I, you can feel free to reach out. The, this is my Twitter handle. There's my email there. I would love to talk to other people working in this space or anyone who wants to understand a little better what we do. I just want to chat and I am open for questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, folks, can we have a huge round of applause for Melissa? <laughs> Amazing. Um, so Melissa, we're getting a lot of um, people resonating with the point that actually the human part of um, the communities or the software or the research or whatever it may be is often the biggest challenge rather than the actual doing of the thing. <laughs> 
Yes, and I feel like I, I have a real gripe with the soft skills term because these are the hard skills. These are not the soft skills at all. It, these are this is the hardest part. Definitely, I fully agree. I wish I, I, I struggle because it's the word people know, and so you have to use it even if you don't agree with it in some ways. Um, so, folks, if you have any um, questions from Alyssa, please uh, you can pop them into the chat. Uh, or etherpad line 162 right now. Um, and we do have one uh, comment saying, um, why did you say outsider? Because I think we all totally relate to what you've just said. <laughs> yeah, so I feel sometimes like I'm in this weird intersection of, I don't know what exactly my work is. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm doing, I, I do some technical work, I do some community work, I do kind of a little bit of everything. And our work is directly related to research projects, but we're not actually a research project. And so I sometimes don't know how to, and I don't know that I have to figure that out. I, I mean, I'm happy where I am. So yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I see the comment and I appreciate that. Hard to define, hard to replace, but <laughs> I, I hope not, because I hope this would be a more common thing. I feel like Yes, research infrastructure, I think, is a good thing. But I also feel like we should have more of these um, cross-project conversations, honestly. I see, you know, from my position, I see a lot of projects struggling and like they would benefit from conversations with other people who are doing the same work, but just in isolation. And so uh, building those bridges, I think, is a big part of what I'm doing right now. It always comes back to building bridges. I just love it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to open the floor a little bit. Also, um, do any of the previous speakers, if you have any questions uh, for one another or for any of the previous speakers, um, please feel free. And to whoever is doing the, the good pinning work here, you are an incredible person. <laughs> Okay. I might be more of a, a comment. I'm happy to just throw it in the ring. Um, and I think it was as I was looking at the job market and figuring out how I wanted to position myself and what kinds of spaces I wanted to be in, I think initially I was feeling quite um, dejected at what I sensed were my options, which was basically a traditional academic role in departments which often have intense politics that I was not ex interested in getting wrapped up in um, or big tech you know and and let's say working for Bex team or something like this in a big tech org and I was not excited about either of those and so I was really, you know, and if you look on LinkedIn, you'll mostly see all the job uh, ads for the big tech. And if you, I don't know, uh, go on the traditional jobs boards for academics, you'll find the academic postings. And so I was like, how do I start? Like, where do I fit? Where, what are the alternative spaces? And I think when I started realizing that some of the open science, open source, you know, some of the communities that I had actually been in touch with in my iHub days, um were were really where a lot of the interesting work and kind of gray messy um in between kind of work that i think several of the other panelists have talked about where there was interesting stuff going on there that that kind of revived me a little bit because i was like okay i could see myself in these kinds of spaces and so the current position i'm at, at code for science and society i found through a twitter job ad that was like from someone i knew and so I think it might still be a little harder to find some of the, these positions because they're not in like your LinkedIn necessarily, unless maybe you follow those people. But um, but for me, it, it revived me to think like, okay, there there is a community, there are communities where this kind of work that's kind of in an in-between um, exists. So I don't know who needs to hear that, but that was really um, helpful for me. Thanks, Angela. Um, oh, Melissa, were you about to say something there? Um, so I was just, if if you don't mind, I, it might 
want to address the financial um the question about the model of financial sustainability and so i don't know if others have different opinions i just quick note is that all of the things that i showed in my slide were um happened because i got supported by someone so first of all i I went to university for free because that's how it works here. And then I did my PhD in Belgium because I got a government scholarship to go there and do my PhD. Um, then I got a diversity scholarship or diversity stipend to go to SciPy, which is why I met <laughs> those people and actually got my job. And now I have a grant. And so it's just, um, yes, all of those are a little bit of luck a little bit of knowing people and I wish we could have a more structured way of supporting these projects and the kind of work that we do. This is the first grant that I've seen that's actually supporting community work. I don't know that this is a common thing at all. Uh, and, and it's the same for the initial work that I was doing on technical writing. That was the first grant that I heard of that supported documentation instead of developing code. Um, so there's a lot to say for maintain, maintenance, um, sustainability, and the kind of work that we don't usually get paid to do, and how that should be valued. So I am a strong um, supporter of making invisible work visible, and I think that community work is one that is often invisible just because it's something it is expected that people will do but not get paid for. And so I think this is something we need to advocate very strongly for. Can I go, angle that question um, also to Angela, because I know your current work is around that. I was just about to unmute. Um, <laughs> I was going to say that I have started being in a, a few more funder meetings. And I think that I'm happy to say many of them are starting to recognize, and so maybe the CZI grant is part of that recognition that a lot more needs to be done. You know, I think there's we're not there yet, but more valuing of that kind of of work. Um, and I think that, for example, the event fund which I manage um, gives out small grants um, of up to about 20k um to to groups working in open data science to to continue to build their communities of practice for some of these grantees it's their very first grant um and so for us it's helping them to also build the organizational capacity to receive the monies to to grow towards whatever it is that they want to grow to but it's but I still unfortunately hear so much feedback that for many it's the first grant where they can actually explicitly write in budget lines for organizer time for childcare stipends for participants, for so much of that invisible um, work and infrastructure that you talked about just now, Melissa, that um, runs all of this, that runs the tech. Like it, you know, it like it's it's mind blowing that we often just focus on the code without recognizing all that needs to go into building some of that. So I hope that it's it's the start of a bigger, you know, paradigm shift, a, a turning point. Um, and I, that's kind of the direction I'm hoping to push it in as well. Thank you so much. Um, and just to comment actually through the uh, chat, Movik has pointed out so many OLS projects have been participants in the grants that you manage, um, as has OLS, and we're all super grateful for that. Um, I'm going to point this one to Jason, because um, I know you talked a lot about um, how important the, the empathy and the communication is. Um, and whether you had any thoughts around emulating um, chance interactions, given that we're communicating largely online these days. Um, and also perhaps just noting that this has been something that was so important from Melissa's talk as well. Yeah, one thing that I'm hearing from the other speakers, and if I'm picking up on a theme and something I found useful is looking for ways to sort of create those opportunities when they don't exist. And, and you can come back around to technology again, because one of the communities that I've been working with is lifestyletrainers.org, uh, which is a goal of trying to get people who do professional development in the, in the life sciences to come together and so they could just chat. You know, that essentially costs almost no money. There's a little bit of my time, obviously, and some technical things. But finding your community, obviously, uh, online is really enabled uh, in a way that it was not 
maybe even 10 years ago, less than that maybe, but not too much less. It's, it's sort of recent that you can really uh, find other people who are working on similar things to you. And I think as you just heard, uh, maybe from Melissa, that you know, the person who's sitting next to you one moment can be the person who's gonna offer you an opportunity, which is really gonna be, uh, he's gonna change what you're able to do. And I've always found that to be the case that, and not that you're guaranteed to always be, you know, get what you want, but you, you wanna put yourself in a position where you can um, ask things of people or, or offer ideas. Uh, and sometimes people say, yeah, that's right. Let's try it. Let's see where it goes. So um, trying to find those, those online, I think that's what open source is all about. Um, conferences and meetings are part of that because you're already selecting for people who have a similar interest. They're also partially um, to blame for bias because oftentimes going to a conference, if it's in person, does incur costs and is not necessarily equal access. So to the extent that online can help, it doesn't actually solve all problems, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's a component of it. And putting yourself out there and maybe, uh, you know, it, to some extent, it's, a, it's another skill that people have to have because if you're more on the introverted side and you don't feel comfortable um, necessarily putting yourself out there, the questions are, what do you feel the most comfortable with? Uh, somebody asked a question about, you know, can you get by with just documentation or just sort of written word? You know, some people may actually prefer that. They may find it, it's like less intimidating and that they're more willing to speak up. So it, it's about trying a lot of different things and finding out where you're the most comfortable, but then also where you are willing to stretch yourself and, and, and put yourself out there. As a, I was just reading an article where somebody was, a, they're a professional writer and they're a minority, but they were, uh, somebody took the time to, comment, I guess, in their Washington Post article that they didn't like their grammar and it wasn't correct and that you should be better. So, um, you know, the, there's there are still ways to put yourself out there and to stretch yourself so that um, you can be heard and people can see that you have a great idea, that you have something to offer and maybe offer you an opportunity that wasn't really formal, as, as was mentioned by some of the speakers, not everything's on a job board. Not everybody knows that, um, you know, what exactly they're looking for, but you may have something to offer that um, people didn't know they wanted until you offered it. So um, try to look for ways to, to, to stretch yourself <laughs> in that way. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, so OLS uh, organizers have been really super wise and we've booked a meeting with someone else in three minutes. So Malvika, do you want to write this? Yes, uh, thank you everybody uh, for joining us and thank you all the speakers for staying for the entire call. This has always been our chance to bring in people who have inspired us personally and we just can't get enough of them. So thank you very, very much. This has been a fantastic call. So folks in the call, there is no real assignments, uh, but there are some reflection exercises. So we haven't had the chance to send you in a breakout room today, but there are some questions we would like you to think about in terms of your role in open leadership. What brought you to work in open leadership? What keeps you motivated for let's say another five years? And what would you do in order to maintain that feeling, motivation or work for the rest of your life? So a lot of discussion today, hopefully will leave you motivated to think about all these questions. Uh, we are always here to respond to any concern you may have and we will add the missing speakers to our Slack so in case you want to get in touch with them, but have uh, shared links in the chat. And you, you will see Maya again in one of the cohort call very soon. Thanks once again. Thank you once again, all the speakers. I'm going to turn off the recording. <laughs>